Hey, everybody. Welcome to Behind the Couch, LA Not So Confidential's live stream companion. Ooh, look at that eyebrow, Scott. Do it again. Nice. See, Esther always tries to say that I've had so much Botox that my forehead doesn't <laughs> move, but I still, I still have eyebrow movement. You absolutely do. They can do Botox so that you still have eyebrow movement, you know. Yeah, don't tell them that. <laughs> You just need to tell them how much arch and movement you want. Right. <laughs> Strategic Botox. Yes. That's what we call it. Um, hi, I'm Dr. Shiloh. I am here with Dr. Scott. And we have an awesome live stream for you today. Very excited yeah. about this. So glad it worked out. Uh, but we have some things to take care of first. We were so bad last month at remembering to do shout outs for our patrons. So all of June, we did your shout outs on the main feed of LA Not So Confidential and our episode on spree killing couples. So hopefully you heard those, but I'm going to do the shout outs right now so far that we have in July. And then we are going to do a raffle, a drawing to pick a winner for a merch item for this for last month, because we haven't done that yet. So playing catch up here. Um, so for this month, we have Amanda, we have Katie M, we have Miss Janet Varney from the JV Club podcast. Thank you, Janet. Uh, we have Casey Delia. I love me some quesadillas. Uh, we have Sharon F and Destiny H. Thank you, guys. We had just kind of a, a flurry of new Patreon members in the last week or so. So thank you so much. Um, let's spin this wheel. Let's get this random name wheel generator going. I did not pick a piece of merch for you guys to win. So the winner is going to be able to go on our merch site and pick something that you want and we will ship it to you. And the winner is... Mary W. All right, Mary W. I will reach out to you on the Patreon website and we'll get you some merch. Pick whatever you want. Get the surf and turf. All right. <laughs> the little and notebooks. You, the, the notebooks are very cool. I got I I've, I've been using them. So yeah, I, I think they're super cool. Um, and then I did what you suggested, Scott, with this one. I started putting all my um, stickers in here that I've been collecting all over the place. Like I'm eight years old. It's my sticker book. <laughs> I love it. It's like the autograph book at Disneyland. Yeah, right. That's what we should promote it as at one of the festivals is like, get your autograph book. Yeah, exactly. A passport, podcast sticker passport for sure. Um, anything else, Scott, before I introduce our guests and have them jump on? No, I'm very excited because I just literally marathoned the entire series over the past two days on one and a half times the speed. So I'm very excited to hear what they actually, their voices actually say. <laughs> so Stacy and Chloe, Chloe, feel free to click on those little orange red buttons and grab a spot. Um, we are so happy to have our guests with us today. We are going to be welcoming Stacy Estenis and Chloe Weaver. And hi, guys, you're together. We're That's together. Awesome. Hi. Awesome. Hi. Thanks for having us. This is Stacy. And this is Chloe. Awesome. Okay, we'll keep it right. Um, thank you so much for making time to be here today. Um, you know, as we went back and forth, I said, you, I told you guys, although we're very forensic psych focused, we do love our backdrop of Los Angeles <laughs> and tend to play with the vintage theme of LA, whether it's our music or our cover art, or we've done series on LA noir crimes from gosh, what now, like the 1800s up to the forties, I think we've covered. Um, and so your podcast felt like it had a little piece of everything that we love. The lore, the architecture, LA, and a crime of someone who seemingly snapped, right? So, yeah, totally. so um, it feels like a great, great um, pairing here, but I would love for you guys to introduce yourselves and tell us about your show. 
Yeah, I'm Stacey Astinius and I um, created the podcast. I wrote and narrated it, produced it. Um, Chloe. Hi, yep, I'm Chloe. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, uh, I'm a cinematographer, so we are just best friends. We've been working on various documentary projects over uh, the course of the last 15 years or so. We met in uh, early, early college. And um, so we paired up as we do as best friends to make um, a documentary kind of on our own dime, on our, at our own pace. And then it transformed um, many times, but then it, you know, ended up as a podcast that Stacy definitely um, pioneered that one herself. Isn't it kind of cool to work on a creative project with your best friend? It really is. Yeah. <laughs> we do really well at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you guys worked on this a long time. Um, Scott and I are going on four years of this podcast and it's just been the neatest thing to be able to share this with the closest friend. It's not many people have that, I think. <laughs> sure. Especially something like this where it's like an obsession and like, let me just for hours and it's like she gets it all you know so there's no explaining i have to do she just knows you know so that's really cool so i feel like i was less obsessed but very inter <laughs> interested very interested in in you know like visually great complimenting her obsession yeah <laughs> yeah uh -huh. there it is. Uh -huh. i like it yeah. i like it so can you tell us um a quick little bit about the urban legend uh, just for people who aren't familiar with it. And then definitely we'll get into the show and your journey with it. Yeah. So the story goes that here in LA, there is a mansion that's like on a hilltop in the Hollywood Hills. And it's been abandoned since the 1950s after there was a Christmas time murder. And if you go up to the windows and look in, you'll see 1950s furniture and wrapped presents and a Christmas tree from the 50s when this happened. So we heard about this about eight years ago. And we're like, there's no way that's true. I'm very logical and very pragmatic. Like, there's no way that's true. Let's just check it out just because I want to just call BS on this. Right. So we go up there and we look in the windows of this house and it's abandoned. There are 50s furniture in the house and there's not a Christmas tree, but there's Christmas wrapping paper. And we just like couldn't believe it. <laughs> and so that is what like kind of blew our minds because normally it's like, let me see the holes in this story. Let me see how people are just believing what they want to believe. Um, so there was some truth to it and that's what started it for both of us. And we always wanted, we've made documentaries before and we were like, this is a great topic for a documentary, us investigating this um, and figuring out, getting down to the bottom of the story. Scott, it, what do you remember about this urban legend or how long ago do you remember hearing well, about it? This, no, I, I've been here for in LA since 87. And so I've heard about this over and over again. And because, because of course, but even before I got into this, into the field of psychology, I was always interested in weird, paranormal, abandoned buildings, all the sort of ephemera of high strangeness. And I remember mm -hmm. reading article after article about this house. And Stacy, are you familiar with the Mandela effect? Yes. Okay. So I completely fell victim to it. Because I was telling Shiloh as I was listening to the episodes, I texted her. I was like, oh, my God, I know that I saw a picture in one of these articles looking through the window with the Christmas tree and the and the and I look, Stacy, I swear to God, I see it clearly in my mind. Yes, it I never happened. It. <laughs> it's been described. It's been described to me so many times. I right. made it up. Amazing. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Like to me, it's, it's, um, shiny. Yes. Like an almost. aluminum Christmas tree. That's the way I yes, think. Yes. But of the it. wrapping paper, like very shiny, almost aluminum, green and red with like thick layer of dust on it. It's just for us, it's fascinating to think how our brains have filled this in mm -hmm. for us. Totally. And then, oh God, I don't want to give anything. Well, I'm going to let you guys take the lead because I have so many questions and comments <laughs> on your interviews. Yeah, there's so much inter I mean, everybody's got to you have to go sign up and listen for this. Listen to it because it's wonderful. Yeah, I, I already at the top. I put their website in the chat room. I'll do that a couple more times throughout. Oh, thank you. Um, but I'm curious. I mean, were you guys true crime buffs at all before the lore of this house? I actually wasn't until I started looking into this house. Then I slowly started getting more into it because I'm very skittish okay. and like I never liked horror movies or anything. So I was <laughs> I would 
anything true crime. But then just in my researching of this house, I started opening myself up to it and realizing that true crime stories are actually just like great mysteries. And I do love mysteries mm -hmm. as long as they're not too gory. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it actually has kind of expanded my interest in true crime for sure. Did you always like true crime? Mm, yes, I did. Yeah. I, I don't like horror movies, but I do like a true story about an unsolved crime. I mean, that is beyond fascinating to me, mm. especially if they're in any way like associated with like there, you know, there's some stories from the Bay area growing up. Okay. Um, okay that I had listened to in podcast form. And I would just like devour that because I have these memories of my childhood and like a story of a missing girl and it's still unsolved. And like that is mind blowing to me. And I love that someone is pursuing an answer to that because it's important yeah. to me in this weird way. Well, it's absolutely important because, you know, as I was listening to your episodes, all I could think about was not only the plasticity of memory, but if our memory is so easily warped, then our view of history and objective, rea objective reality mm -hmm. is Absolutely. really fucked, right? Absolutely. I mean, just that, that this story could take on such a life of its own and a personality of its own, and we were all wrong about it. Yeah, totally. What, what you illuminate is so incredibly bittersweet as well, because it's right. a commentary on class, it's a commentary on race. It's a commentary on mental illness, how, on <laughs> mental illness, how fucked up the uh, L.A. city uh, licensing or whatever you call it for like building permits. <laughs> oh, yeah. building and safety. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you you guys managed to hit an entire yeah. set of bullet points I was not expecting at all. Absolutely. So right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, and I think it's such a brilliant formula because what you do is you take this urban legend that you can give this quick elevator pitch about, but then every piece of it, every like key nugget that gets passed down is what basically you dedicate an episode to or kind of research to say, all right, let's see if this nugget's true. Let's see if this is true. And at the beginning, when you find that, you know, some of them are like even just seeing yeah. the wrapping paper with your own eyes, you're like, okay something yeah. to this yeah. um but i i think you know I, I mentioned in our last episode when i was raving about it how it just felt so fulfilling to listen to how you did this formula but also you dove just deep enough to where there was not like frivolous padding in this podcast and it was succinct and it was just like at the end of podcasts, I don't get a whole lot of resolve sometimes. And this one felt felt like a Christmas present wrapped up. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. When I heard you say yeah. that, that to me is like the highest praise because that's what I want in a podcast is I want a solved crime. Yeah. I want a straight, like I want answers and I want to feel like, okay, they answered all my questions, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, that's what I intended to do with making this a podcast. Cause as a documentary, there were a lot of things we couldn't say, or it'd be hard to visualize. You're very tied to a visual, but in a podcast, I could kind of go anywhere I wanted. Um, yeah. And I felt like that would be the best way for us to really solve a mystery. Um, so that's like, I love that you said that. Cause that was the goal, you know? Good. Well, I, I feel like you have resolution mm -hmm. at the end. You know, there are so totally. many, what one of the we we talk about or we get asked in in interviews about the cases that have stuck with us that we can't let go of and there's one that still to this day it will never be resolved because it has to do with just the banality of evil and human nature and I'll, i will i don't know if i'll ever be able to find resolution with that story so i love how this one gave me just this whole panoply of emotions and twists and turns that I didn't expect. And at the end, I walk away from it going, yeah, I, I mm -hmm. now I, I, I have an ending to this. Except yeah. now I want somebody to buy it and do something really wonderful uh, with I it. I know. You know, that's the real, the real final piece. I thought it would be demolished. I'm glad somebody mm -hmm. is putting in the effort to get it renovated. We'll see if that happens. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that'll be the last piece. I, I've got a, I, I'm, I'm a working bloke. I am not wealthy, but I call myself wealthy adjacent. I have a couple of friends that are very, very well off. And one of them, a couple of years ago, almost bought the Ennis house, which is one of the oh. 
Frank Lloyd Wright. And right, it's like, like a twenty million dollar house, <laughs> I think something uh, like that and more. Yeah. But it's not only the price. And some and there's a there's a, a very successful cannabis entrepreneur who ended up buying it. That's right. Um, but oh, the Snowden house, you mean? That's who um, bought the Snowden house. Is no, this was, the, this was the this was the end. Okay. The cannabis guy by the maybe I'm getting them mixed up, but I do One know it's other. all that Frank Lloyd Wright. You know, it's that beautiful construction. But my buddy that almost bought the the Ennis house was talked out of it by an architect because he said you will be paying. Do the some of these structures, including some of the Spanish structures, were actually never meant to be built on this kind of terrain. Mm. And the upkeep is not just gonna be renovation, it's gonna be millions of dollars every decade. So mm. I was like wondering, like, I wonder if this house is gonna have those kind of issues too, because there's, the city was making so many demands on yeah, for sure. what right. you can do just as a, as a baseline for moving in. I know. And it sounded like a lot of that was probably foundational and the fact that it's on a hill and the grading and all of that that has to um, preserve the structure. Scott, yeah. have you been up to the Los Feliz house? No, no, I can't believe in all this. Like, <laughs> and, and, go, and yet I still right. have that memory of like, I've got that picture in my head. I've never been there. Before well, it changes anymore, you got to get up there. Yeah, yeah, sure. definitely. A, couple, a few months ago, I went to a friend's house and she lives up in the area and we did basically a hike and came around the Ennis house and then looked over the fence Down. at the back of it. And um, that's the closest I've been. She's like, well, do you want to walk around the front? And I was like, I can't be one of those people. Like, I know it's dark and everything, but I just feel so bad. She's like, well, I live around here. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's my okay. neighborhood. you're with me. And I was just like, ah, it's okay. <laughs> but now I'm like, oh, okay. Now, I mean, and so, that's, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you guys, what kind of question, like, I don't want to give away all of the twists and turns of your, your series, but so what kind of questions do you, can I ask? <laughs> <laughs> well, ask it and then no. say no. <laughs> okay. Just ask it. Yeah. Okay. So you know what? I actually, I had a, I had a, uh, an ulterior motive for that question. I'll tell you, <laughs> so you, you, you don't have to answer it, but I'll tell you, I had a real problem with stuff being removed from the house. Yeah, that's a tough Like one. I'd like that really that whole section I did not expect to as as small of an item as it was. Mm -hmm. It really kind of messed me up. Like mm -hmm. I couldn't understand the motivation of doing that. I mean, yeah. I'm I'm kind of amazed that as many people have actually gone in there right. that it's there was still as much stuff as there was, but yeah. That one incident with that particular item, I just yeah. came away feeling uneasy about the decision process that led to somebody thinking it was okay to do that. Yeah, that's something that we've gotten a lot of feedback about. Really? Any like there there's been a lot of things, but that's one of them where people are just like they have the same mindset that you do about it. And we do too. I mean, it's not something that we like agree with or support, but you know, as documentarians going into this, it's like here we are witnessing this person and what does it say about this person that they did this thing and to us it's so interesting um and it felt really important to the story um but it's not yeah that's not an easy one because it's not like oh great this is so awesome i'm so glad you did this and now i have it and like wow this is great it's kind of like i don't know right you know i mean i i, I, mean, I kind of love that you have it too but it was like <laughs> oh that was such a weird process about like Absolutely. the motivation to do it like it's yeah and it's been, it says a lot about, I think, the power of urban myth, right? It's going to drive somebody to go do something so wild like that. And also people, their obsessions with reality shows and celebrity and yes. you know being famous and all that stuff. Um, so I think it's more social commentary. We kind of look at it as outsiders. Like, this happened. We documented it. Mm -hmm. We do not condone this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, yeah. So that um, we, we've gotten a lot of feedback about that, actually. People have... People have things to say about it for sure. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. It brings up kind of the theme. There's so many like true crime themes that are in here, but um, one we talk about sometimes is like visiting locations where true crime, horrible, violent crimes have happened. And I mean, I was gonna say I've done it. Scott and I just hosted a downtown LA walking tour with 20 of our our listeners where you know we went to the cecil hotel and you know a bunch of different places but i know when i go somewhere 
it gives me perspective Mm -hmm. And for places that I've read about or heard about or kind of picture in my mind, especially when you're kind of putting on your detective hat and you're thinking about these cases, it gives perspective. Um, whereas someone else might say, that's awful. It's morbid. Like, what are you doing here? There were like real victims that suffered, which mm -hmm. yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I don't know if I can explain why, you know, it's draws me in to be um, to go somewhere like that. But yeah. Did you find that that was uh, in talking to, and I love that the episode is called fan girls, but talking to these individuals and the urban explorers, was anyone sort of battling back and forth with that conflict? Um, about like feeling bad about going to the house or right. Or the people that went in the house and went up to it. No. They don't, no issues with that, yeah. Um, but there were a mixture of, a lot of people had, had gone in, but some people had rules about being respectful when they went in. And yeah, some, there are different less, levels. Some less so. It was yeah. a, a whole variety, I feel like. Yeah, um, I don't know, It's a, it was a wide spectrum of people. We met so many different people on different levels. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was hard for us because I never ever wanted to go inside the house without a proper filming right. permit like a location release, all official. Right. Um, and that was the way we ended up doing it. Um, because, you know, the neighbors were angry at us. We'd been yelled at by them. We got yelled at when we did our drone shoot. The guy who lives mm -hmm. next door came out screaming at us, like, my kids are sleeping. And the drone's very loud. I was like, oh, oh my God, I'm so sorry. You know, we felt awful. Like, we're not here to cause trouble, even though we were causing trouble because this drone was loud and it was like 6 a.m. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't feel good to do any of that, you know? Um, so I know we definitely had moments like that. And the neighbors were just like justifiably upset. And they were in court when we when the house was um, being bid on because they it, they have a personal interest in mm -hmm. seeing this, seeing who the new owners are, making sure, sure that this house yeah. is going to become taken care of so that it's not like a nuisance anymore, you know? So yeah, that's a big part of the story. I wish we could have interviewed some of the angry neighbors, but they're angry neighbors. So well, you know, was, there, was there any attempt to like knock on doors and be like, hey, this is what we're doing? And oh yeah. 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 And you know, one of the neighbors right in front of us, she ended up being, she was very civil with us. Um, they ended up moving away. Mm -hmm. um, so, but they had endured years of just people, I describe it in the podcast, like they look out their kitchen window and they see the, the whole house. So okay. if anybody's up there, people go up there and cause real trouble up there, you know, like daily, daily. Yeah. Daily. Especially yeah. at Halloween too. Um, oh, and bet. so I can't imagine wow. that. And Christmas, wow. probably. <laughs> yeah, Christmas, yeah. So they would come out and they'll just yell at you. Be like, we're calling the cops. And they would call Rudy and say, Rudy, there's people at your house. And he'd be like, okay. And, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a real problem for those people and we wanted to be respectful to them. At the same time, telling this story, I feel like really solving the mystery and taking away all of the urban myth that surrounds this house, I felt like was important for them too, you know? Um, That's what well, you wrote them letters. I did, I wrote them try, letters. Because we wanted their, their perspective mm -hmm. because we are ultimately trying to <clears throat> give them peace in the you know, by, by kind of exposing everything and exploring yeah. it all, yeah. the hope was to like have resolution mm -hmm. and have their perspective as part of like the storytelling. Yeah. Um, and I think that you wrote like a very convincing letter, but they, you know, they were not wanting to ultimately decline. Yeah. There are a lot of people that didn't want to participate, but that would have been another well. interesting side of the story to hear. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a hardship for them, you know, and we tried to be very respectful of that. Yeah. I think they'd rather not talk about it anymore. <laughs> yeah, they're like, we're over this house. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and all you can do is be sincere with your goal of like, we are trying to lay this to rest and yeah. maybe it'll help, you know, your quality of life on this street. But, you know, I think it's so interesting with after listening to your podcast, getting that resolve, getting some answers and realizing that a bunch of it is just, okay, stuff that we've made up in our heads when I see images of the home now, especially in the daytime and there's the construction fences and things like that, it doesn't look as right ominous that's anymore. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah. wow, that's like, it. Whatever, <laughs> just a house. Yeah, right. Right. Is you have to go, you have to play scary music, you have to go at dusk. Wow. Yeah. Like Stacey yes. playing scary horror oh, sound. You sound you're that's, how <laughs> that's how you scare yourself. Yeah, you're well, right. it, it, it can look quite normal. I encourage everyone to go to the website to see all of the footage that you guys do have. And I think it's so neat because it makes it 
since you started out as a docu documentary, you have all of this, which makes it an immersive experience totally. for people who don't live around here and can't go do these things. Right. Um, what what was the turning point for you to say no to really doing a documentary and saying this is more podcast worthy? I think it was um, Chloe was the one who she told me a couple times. She's like, Stace, I think this is a podcast because mm -hmm. I would come to her and say, how can we? You know, when Wes and I were looking through boxes of old records, I'm like, this is so so cool. Like, how do we integrate this into the story? How do I put myself in here? Um, do we do reenactments? And and she's my DP, so I'm like, how do we make this look cool? How do we shoot this? And she's like, I think it's just better if we don't even shoot it at all. And you, I mean, that's what you told me. Well, there were continual moments where, like, Stacy, you know, Stacy's obviously like deep diving continually. Um, and her, the story of Stacy's journey in, in like finding yeah. these things, like when we set out to make the podcast, we like decided to not include that because like that's all consuming, right? For Stacy to like also be on camera, we just like, were like, that's cool, but that's not what we're gonna do. Yeah. But then yeah. It, it became the thing that was the most interesting. So when Stacy, when when we're assembling footage, we're like, yep, we have something special here, but like all the details about Stacy's journey aren't a part of it. And the yeah. only way to, to integrate that is to now do it like with audio and it's just more fascinating. Yeah. yeah. And the your hands aren't tied narratively. You can do whatever you want in a podcast, which is yeah. great, you know? And so the, I, to me, that was freedom. I was like, wow. Cause as an editor, I'm trying to piece this together and then getting us together to shoot stuff and then getting location releases. And it's just like, instead I can just type up a little script, you know, and put it all together. Um, and I really felt like I felt free and that I could tell this story how I wanted to tell it. Um, and we did it all on our own too. We had initial talks with like a podcast production company that didn't pan out. And you know what, it's for the best because they would have given us notes and would have maybe sent us in a different direction. Um, and that's always great to have the collaborative environment. But for me, I was like, I want to tell the story how I want to tell it. And I got to, so, it was better that way, for sure. <laughs> well, and it, so it seems like so much true crime these days, whether it's a book or a podcast or even some documentaries, the creator's experience is that parallel story. And I think it's very engaging for people because they kind of see a piece of themselves in it of like, mm -hmm. this is what I love. I love the investigative piece and finding these. And I wish I had time to go do something like that. Yeah. Um, so that seems to be a very... Um, successful way to do it mm -hmm. but i think it brought so much richness to it and i love that we got to hear about all the other cool places in la that you got to go to do your research that's true yeah, oh, I, yeah. Was oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like do people really want to hear about the coroner's office i'm going to tell them anyways <laughs> because it's interesting yes you've been there My beach oh, God, you've got a towel. <laughs> i can't believe i can't believe they shut that down because i, I used to whenever friends were, i would take friends there it was a gem. It was like so random. You're just like, what is happening? It's a gift shop. Is this in poor taste? I don't know, but I'm here. <laughs> it was amazing. It was such a- I'm so glad um, you have that. That's so fun. awesome. Yeah, Scott, when Scott and I were doing our internship, um, 2008, 2009, I took him down there. Or did, did I took you, right? Did you, hello? No, you brought me oh, the- uh, I, I brought you pen. some stuff back. Okay, so I brought him like the outline body shape pen um, but yeah, I went probably three years ago. I took some colleagues and the woman said, what do you want? If you see something and I don't have it, order it because the new corner is going to shut it down. So we got the heads up and I was like, I need a beach towel. <laughs> oh my <laughs> God, that's awesome. Towel. So I bought a bunch of stuff Very because funny. I knew. Yeah, it, see, now I want so I didn't want to buy anything. I was like, this is weird. But now I wish I had bought something. Yeah. It was so crazy. Yeah, it, it is very crazy. But I, I think, you know, hearing about places like that, that literally doesn't exist anymore, or sort of the underground tunnels of Los Angeles, yeah. again, like that's, that's our history. And so this became a history podcast, too, in a lot yeah. of different ways. Yeah, which I love because people don't think L.A. has history. We oh. have history. We're a very old city. There's a lot here. You have to look closely. You have to really dig deep. Um, and so me stumbling on little gems like that, I would just it just increased my love for Los Angeles and history. I was just like, this is so awesome to be spending my days doing this kind of stuff, you know, and learning more about the history of the city. 
Sure. Well, and, and again, I think you did something really valuable in that you provided a particular perspective that goes back literally decades and gave clarity and objective reality to things that have been clouded in mystery. I, I think that's incredibly valuable. Your yeah. discovery of those records randomly mm -hmm. in Rudy's house was yeah. mind blowing. Like yeah, what a treasure trove. I know. I know. <laughs> totally. You couldn't believe that was like the very end of all of our work researching. We were like, we've already researched everything, have all our questions answered. And we have this box and me and Wes were just like, what? Yeah. So very exciting. I kind of miss my researching days. <laughs> I need oh, I bet to research. <laughs> And give us give us the time frame of when you very first started to when you really wrapped it up. Yeah, we went to see the house in 2013, probably started in earnest in 2014. Mm -hmm. 2016, we shot most of our interviews. That was a big year. That was also the year the house was sold. So there was a lot going on. It was very wow. like, this is topical. We need to get these interviews now. Um, so yeah, I mean, overall, it was seven years um, that was spent just working on this in whatever capacity. Well, and I, I feel like um, the timing is is really important for a lot of reasons. One, like laying out the timeline for us of just actually how recent a story this is. Because, talk you know, Scott, talk about Mandela effect. If I had to guess, mm -hmm. I would have said, oh, I heard about this 25 years ago. Well, yeah. that's not possible because, you know, the LA Times article hadn't been out then. Yeah, before 2009. You're right. I think that I had to, I like checked that so many times i kept checking i was like are you right. sure are you sure are you sure that this wasn't on the map before 2009 i checked it i checked it i checked it it didn't exist people it wasn't newsworthy until 2009. <laughs> I, there's also something so valuable that you uncover and you guys hold it sort of lightly in a way that i think is so elegant because it lets the listener make a judgment or have their experience of it and so of course i had a huge experience which was the guy who started all the rumors who just like oh i like fucking with people steve yes you, you do i mean okay <laughs> I'm you know, like, it's, it's a big thing of like no you're are actually your words have have consequences you know <laughs> you can have fun with that but like yeah yeah they have Again, another Another moment of social commentary, I think that I tried to be as objective as I could. Here are the yeah. players, you know, yeah. yes. this is you did a story. great job. Um, but yeah, I mean, I agree. It's kind of like, wow, that's the kind of person you are, huh? You're a liar, huh? Cool. <laughs> you know, I mean, I know. <laughs> it, made, I know. it made our story better, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I mean, you found where the story started, which yeah. is like, uh, <laughs> how often can you go back and track and it's literally a made up story like it's not even you know there's the la times article but then you have the guy that led to that who just totally. it came out of his brain <laughs> i know that that to me was very satisfying because as far as i wanted to like get rid of an urban myth like make it real and i think that the first thing you can do is to find out where did this truly truly start yeah. and to find him and to hear his story i was like we we did it i mean this is where it really started because it has to start somewhere you know so that was very gratifying for us and thankfully he was open because some people are like i don't want to talk to you sure um, so i'm grateful that he was open and wanted to tell his story and he's not ashamed he's like this is what it is you know so <laughs> Or he's a he's a great character. I mean, he's yeah. a oh, great yeah, character. Sure. It's just somewhat sure. shocking that you're like, oh wait, you set into motion a whole set of people <laughs> quoting what they think is a legit source, and it's not a legit source. He you know, it's it. all like yeah, he's very a game. It's a game of whisper, you know. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you also one of the things about uh, Shiloh and I working together is she really is. Uh, scully and i'm balder like i am more like i want to believe right. i want if there's anything that even hints at <laughs> otherworldliness or high strangeness i wouldn't know it and i have had like really amazing clairvoyance and and sort of people who claim that they have sort of other kinds of knowledge and it's always been a fascinating experience for me um and you know and some real charlatans out there as well some real charlatans <laughs> so i died laughing on the elliptical at the gym when you guys describe the the medium that just like bursts into tears 
Oh, oh yeah. I, There's I that wanted on YouTube. to, I, I was like, damn, I want a whole episode where they went out and, and invited 10 different mediums to all give their impressions of what went, what went on. Yeah. Yeah, that, there's a video of that on YouTube. That's why I asked them about it specifically because they're in the house and then they have this medium. It's um, Denise Dorado is her name if you search it on YouTube. And she like brings in the medium or something. I don't even know the context of the video, but I just asked them about it. I was like, you brought this guy in and the guy is crying in it. It's, I mean, it's amazing. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, there's some, well, I don't I know. Mean, here, when in doubt, cry, right? This is the way I, this is also the way I look at it is like, if, if you, if such a type of uh, gift exists, and if you have it, mm -hmm. then you use it in an appropriate way. And yeah. like, if I was to break down crime in private sessions, whenever somebody is relating their trauma to me, I would not be a very good clinician, you know? Mm, right, I, right. I have to have to kind of hold this. <laughs> I just I just had this vision in my head, probably another Mandela effect. Now I'll, I'll probably claim in 10 <laughs> years, no, I saw this guy crying. Yeah, you can't um, watch the actual video. Yeah, you have to, it has to live in your mind. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and I think, you know, to bookend, you you found the root of the story and where it started, but then to bookend it, I feel like the timing was magic too, because it's like the last flames of information were really starting to go out with mm -hmm. losing people and the ages that they were and yeah. mm -hmm. the relationships that you built to lead to getting these stories documented was, yeah. I mean, that had to feel just, I mean, really impactful to you guys. For sure. Yeah. Stories. These, these stories are going away because these, these men that we interviewed, that we talked to that know the story, they're aging and gone. And um, right. Richard, whose house we had gone to, he, he passed away um, mm -hmm. two years ago. And yeah, so, you know, it is, it does feel like we just finally got the answers um, right mm -hmm. before, anybody else would have been able to, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'm glad because I think the story of the Enriquez family is a really important one to tell. And it's like the kind of forgotten history or people don't care, you know, oh, and no. like should care, you know? Absolutely. Um, it's, it's, such a, it's such a part. commentary. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's such a commentary. It really yeah. is. Um, yeah, I was watching a complete like historical webinar on Chavez Ravine and the redlining done there. And yeah. just, you know, the, People don't realize what happened there. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. Peter Dodgers Stadium, you don't even know what happened there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And just to think of this family purchasing this land in Los Feliz um, and never living there, never enjoying it. And that's probably why. Yep. Um, yeah. Heartbreaking all the way around. But I'm so glad that you captured these stories from these folks. Yeah. So, I mean, let's talk about the crime a little bit. And, you know, I was thinking about this in modern day um, ways in which we sort of categorize crimes. And it kind of, yes, it's a murder suicide, but it also feels like family annihilator, you know, uh, phenomenon that we see. And you guys really dig to the root of that as well to show that it, it really seemed like it was a combination of mental illness and what we see in some family annihilator situations, financial, financial problems, yeah. you know, the financial problems and the the um, the issues around masculinity to which I'll just take out my entire family instead of us being poor. Right. Um, you know, I thought that was that was really great to kind of put a label on that and not just say that, oh, my God, you know, the story like this doctor just went mad and yeah he went crazy yeah what happened and mm -hmm. um and even finding the locations and the records where he had been hospitalized and 5150'd and these previous suicide attempts i mean it's like it all falls into place and makes sense mm -hmm. yeah especially does. us looking at you know past behavior and kind of that that spiral downward yeah can, can you give us an overview of what the myth is like if you were going to bullet point the myth of it, you gave a little bit at the beginning, but yeah, circle back around to that. Yeah. So Dr. Pearlson, he um, has his three kids and he's living in this house in the fifties and you know, something happens and he goes crazy and he kills his wife with a ball peen hammer. And then he goes to his oldest daughter and in the middle, he, of, the in the middle of the night and he hits her over the head with the same hammer. She survives and runs away. 
Um, and the other two children are still sleeping. Um, they wake up and he tells them, go back to bed. This is a nightmare. And then he takes a fatal dose of pills and he dies by suicide. The police show up and they see that there's <laughs> uh, he drank acid. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. He drank acid. Um, and so, yeah, there were some signs of financial distress, but nobody really knew. And it just really becomes this, he went crazy. That's it. You know? Yeah. Well, and that's how people like to categorize things like that, especially if it's something horrific and mm -hmm. to put some distance between yourself and, you know, you might even relate to this person. These people are wealthy. These people live yeah. in your neighborhood. It's not the, you know, violence that happened on the other side of town or something right. like that. So yeah. to, to put more distance in between it by just saying that somebody went crazy makes it less scary or like it could be you or your family. Well, and like you said, he was the wealthy doctor. That's, mm. you know, made national headlines. It was in hundreds of newspapers because he's the wealthy doctor in Los Angeles. Um, and that interests people because they're like, oh, didn't he have it all? And then he just threw it all away. And, you know, um, so, yeah. yeah. And it's also, you know, it, there's a big part of the American dream there, too. This whole I'm going to, you know, especially in 1950s America, I'm going to give my family everything and we're going to look good and we're going to have this house on the hill because before they lived in a very modest home and their finances didn't allow for them mm -hmm. to have a house like that. Um, but it was important. Appearances were important. And even though this person is suffering from mental health issues that were not very treatable in the 50s, mm -hmm. right. um, he's going to live beyond his means. It's a combination of things that come into play. And it's really a sad story, you know. Yeah, the stressors that were leading up are pretty apparent. Totally. And had he made money on his invention or he got sort of duped in that, right? Somebody yeah. he, he explained he about the invention and where his money was gonna be coming from. He didn't make he didn't make money on that. Oh, okay. Um okay. and as far as we could tell from the records we pulled, it looked like he was trying to get money however he could. So the car accident that the kids were in, um, they were okay. And I think that he was feeling rather litigious and thinking I'm going to make some money off of that and probably trying to get some money to make up to recoup for all the losses that he had mm -hmm. because he didn't, I mean, he didn't have enough money to support anything that he was doing in his life. Um, so, and then he opens a medical practice um, just a couple years before everything goes down again, something he couldn't afford, but he thought maybe, mm -hmm. you know, maybe I can recoup all my costs. Maybe this will be a very successful medical practice. And it was just too much. You know, he kept trying to make, the money that he wanted to make and he wasn't able to do it yeah so. well there's also i i found it fascinating too that you were able to get even more details about one of the potential stressors being his wife and daughter yeah really spending beyond their means and hiding it so that it kept bubbling up that like mm. not only were was he having to deal with his bills but like this sort of surreptitious or hidden spending that they were engaging in. Yeah. And yeah, is it yeah. that interesting that that's where the, the majority of his rage went was and towards. That, it makes sense. Women. Yeah. Because to use a hammer is an act of rage. And the fact that he didn't go to the, Very intimate. Kids, it is. And um, you know, that information that we got from an anonymous neighbor um, was just kind of mind blowing because it, it made sense. It just, yeah. it made sense. You know, you could have, you have all these pills, you could have drugged your whole family. But instead, he's going at two people that he's angry at. Um, and it just it, it it just puts it into this perspective that, you know, it just kind of makes sense, you know? Yeah, for sure. Well, it it pushes against just this myth and figuring out the real things that are troubling real people. Yeah. Um, so Harold and his wife are buried next to each other. Mm hmm. A little uncomfortable with her being buried next to her murderer. I wonder about that. Yes. Were you guys able, I know. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, did you guys find any information about like, did, had they had plots already purchased and I don't know about that. Decided to do or they had their funeral was together. So that was listed in the newspaper. They had their, it was Harold and Lillian's funeral was together. So oh. I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't know if the family was angry at him or like what, how that all went down. Maybe it was already, maybe it was already like a purchase package. I don't know, but yeah, yeah. That, that was interesting to me. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, there's so many, so many things we don't know about the Pearlsons because we don't have contact with 
any sure. of those family members to give us those answers that just the, the context of everything, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. I wonder how much the kids themselves understand about what happened. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, that would, well, clearly they don't want to, they don't want to communicate. You don't want to talk about it. No. Mm -hmm. yeah. no. And I understand that I think completely, but it, yeah, I just, I'm curious if you actually know so much more mm. and have been able to fit puzzle pieces together that they have not ever had Oh, I wonder, like, if they the knew ability. about the medical records that we, because they, they? Didn't I, I'm kind yeah. of guessing that they would not. Sure. Yeah, because we heard from a neighbor that whenever he went for mental health treatment, he was, they said he had heart trouble. So, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe, maybe they didn't know. Very secretive. Know. Yeah. How From old, how old were the, the two younger kids? They were nine and 11, I believe, if I have that correct. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, and certainly I absolutely have complete respect for everybody's own individual experience of trauma and we need to respect that certainly and i would also say that like um it would probably be helpful to process this rather than pushing something like this away even yeah. if it is decades ago you know it's okay. never too late to process that kind of debilitating trauma yeah well and the kids got sent away to the east coast right so mm -hmm. and i'm sure they well, I don't know if they attended their parents' funeral, but you know, if you think you have maybe family on the East Coast just kind of arranging to have them buried and just wanting to be over and done with the family tragedy, like yeah, well, yeah, because their estate had to be settled, and that was years. It true. took yeah. it took until 1963 before the estate was fully settled, according to court records. So there's all this stuff going back and forth, financial mm -hmm. stuff, taking care of things. So yeah, probably just nice and easy, get the yeah. plots and yeah, right. Like, Right. You know, it. Um, one of the things we, I mean, it, here in the few minutes that we have left, I, I do want to circle around because this will be posted on YouTube and so for, for other people to review. I think it is important and fascinating that while I agree with you, Stacey, I'm not going to let go with the house is cursed, but it is very interesting about how many tragedies occurred in that house yeah and since it's building you know i mean it's really yeah. sad and it like is. i don't you know i'm not saying that there's any connection but and you make a great point that at prior to sort of modern managed medical care people did tend to die in their houses mm -hmm. right like that's just where you died yeah but even so there was mm -hmm. a, a lot of illness and sickness in that house yeah well, and to read usually when you read court documents they're very boring very dry language and we're reading stuff about so we're looking at the these people's lives and hoping to see maybe the address in one of the documents make sure we're you know we have it right and instead we have paragraphs about the house itself mm -hmm. in the 30s being uninhabitable so it's like how could the story of this house actually be in the court documents? It was so specific mm. and so mind blowing because you don't expect that when you're researching a house. Usually the story isn't that rich. There isn't that much there. Um, but the house itself upset people <laughs> for a long time, you know, so that was really exciting to read that stuff because it's kind of like it is more than just about the people that live there, but the house itself, the way it was built. Um, it was kind of a problem house and still is, <laughs> you know, so that I, I know mean, I'm like, what's yeah. in that the walls that are making people sick? And yeah, exactly. What made that kid sick right. um, in the 30s? Well, I, I, <laughs> I was going to say, you know, I was wondering about that and I couldn't help but think, I wonder if the doctor was implying that the, the boy was too sickly to go up and down. 50 steps. Well, it said, yeah, the house is making him sick. So it could be, it could be that he was already ill and it's making him worse. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I could see that. Who yeah. knows? I wish I had more on that one. <laughs> well, and fascinating. when Scott and I have learned, especially when we did like these vintage cases, all the documentation back then was just different and people spoke different and yes. everything was much more theatrical. Yeah. The way <laughs> yeah yeah. And so, handwriting, people use handwriting that's like illegible. Yeah. I was looking at Florence Schumacher's death certificate for months before I could figure out what it said. It was just like this flowery handwriting. I'm like, come on, get out your typewriter. Well, I, th I think that's that's also something like I used to get, I, I could go to my, my mother passed away a few years ago in her early, early 90s. But that was something when I would get something that had cursive writing that was illegible to me, like, what is this? she could name it like that because they just oh, it was okay. so part of their 
education. Right. You know, we just yeah. don't do that anymore. Totally. Yeah. So of all the twists and turns for e I'd like to hear from each of you, what was the biggest like shocker or like just, oh my God, this is the coolest thing. There's so many, but I'm like wondering yeah. what spoke to each of you. The, the biggest one to me, sort of a spoiler, I guess, but whatever, the, to me was finding the documents with Wes, with Rudy's handwritten notes and on the backside of the Dr. Per Dr. Pearlson's patient files. That was insane. Couldn't mm -hmm. believe it. Still can't believe it. Like it's that's so odd, right? I like totally get it though. I get that. <laughs> you read his paper? <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll, the reason I get it is, um, I, my parents were born during the depression Yeah, and they grew up like my father grew up in, uh, in Alabama, basically it, born in a, a dirt floor cabin. And when he was in the army, he would receive letters and they were so poor that his mother would have to take pieces of wallpaper wow. off mm -hmm. to write on the back. <clears throat> so I just know as a clinician that yeah. many times children can inherit that feeling of scarcity mm -hmm. and lack yeah. from their parents, even though Rudy was like this millionaire, right. not tapping into any funds. Yeah. He was trying to be as practical as possible. Well, totally. look, this, this card is perfectly, this file folder is perfectly fine. Let me flip it over and, and write notes on it. But I just <laughs> yeah. love that you found it. Like it was, you know, the, it's like a palimpsest. set. You get two stories at the same time, right? Exactly. That was what was wild because the house had been cleared out many years at this point. Mm -hmm. And I had never, the only Pearlson thing I had seen was the old film reel. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I was like, we're done with the Pearlson side of the story. We're looking into the Enriquez side of the story. And then we had Harold Pearlson stuff right there in my house. I was like, what? I just, I was so shocked. I, I thought it was only Enriquez stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to have that and it made its way all the way to my house where I'm now looking at it, I was not expecting it. So that was major. What yeah. was your biggest? Uh, I, I'm kind of, I'm really like loving this kind of more surfacey uh, part of the story, which is just like people's fascination with the house, like mm -hmm. because the amount of online content is absurd. And like the people who have decided to go there, like I'm obsessed with that, like human desire to chase that type of thing and like and just people's behavior and like there's a whole gamut of it but then also in addition to that because that's what kind of ignited us i think and like we were we were determined to make something knowing knowing that there was an already a, like an incredible interest it's already proven um we can make this like I, i'm still kind of clinging to that because that was my initial heartstring yeah. uh, but i also uh we had like a very unusual experience with the police officer who visited stacy's house right, oh, right. With these documents and we kind of like both kept looking at each other like is this happening i want to talk to you guys offline about that <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Awesome. i don't want to get yeah. anybody in trouble yeah. but yeah sure yeah uh but you know it, it happened yeah. very suddenly like we happened to be visiting each other we yeah. get this call and uh he's coming over yeah. and then he's yeah. at the door yeah, and then we're crying <laughs> over a folder and seeing some photos that Stacey couldn't see and like making eye contact. Anyway, so we, we uh, that was exciting. That was, really yeah, that. he came fully uniformed. I was like, what yeah. is happening? There's a cop in my house. Right. Yeah, so that one, I wish we could tell more about that story. But it's but... connected in the same way. He was fascinated by <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Too. He took Everybody it. Oh, that's cool. It. Because when I, when I asked him about it, I was like, I just want to see if I can get some crime scene photos. And he was like, this sounds interesting to me. Let me spend some of my own time to look into this. Right. I was like, okay, fine. You know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, well, it speaks to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got to tour the, the LAPD slash FBI crime library. There's an enormous, Whoa. enormous, <laughs> wonderful, um, in room that just it feels like you're looking at that last scene from indiana jones and the raider of the lost art yeah. because they're pulling oh all like the boxes have been scattered to different divisions across la county for yeah. decades and and they're pulling them back and meticulously and it's a staff of two very dedicated individuals and they revealed a couple of things that i was like wow that's crazy they're like um you can't tell anybody <laughs> so I, I can't i can't tell you what they told me but it was like kind of mind-blowing stuff that's but torture I, I, 
I love that yeah. you got that. And I, do you think that there's any hope for you guys to, to transition this into uh, a film documentary series? I mean, look, that's what, you know, I had a couple of problems with the Cecil hotel documentary, but in the, in the end, yeah. I think it did a great um, justice to the life of Elisa land and the death. I of Elisa agree. Land. And I, I would love for you guys to have that opportunity to do that for this house and these, these families. Yeah, that would be great, you know, and we just got to a point where we did kind of, we shopped it around with some production companies when we still wanted it to be a documentary and things didn't pan out, you know, and it's just, it's such exhausting work to do ourselves, you know, um, yeah. pitching this thing, making decks and the whole thing. And, you know, not that I'm not up for the work and the challenge, um, but it just got to a point where it's like, you know, what, I'm just going to, I'm going to make this. Um, and it would be great if then, you know, you can see the footage on our website. Um, you you know, people can see the potential is there and maybe yeah. we we kind of rework the, you know, uh, reverse engineer it, right? And someone can come to yeah. us. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of, I mean, that would be the hope. I think that'd be really awesome because I think that um, there's enough there that somebody could make a whole mini series out of it. I just, she and I couldn't do it on our own anymore. <laughs> you know? Right, we would um, love for someone to become interested and want to have yeah. those assets from us though. Yeah, that'd be great. Cause you know, it's just all this footage, all these interviews, it's all this great stuff. Um, that I think to have a visual companion would be would be really great. Yeah, yeah. Well, what I, it's, you've created is is absolutely fascinating and, and incredibly impressive. Um, and you. maybe it reaches a different audience. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's mutually exclusive to to have the desire to um, to put it in that format because I, I in my experience there is a, a bit there's some overlay in the audiences between true mm -hmm. crime podcasts and the, the series, but yeah. not everybody that listens to podcasts will go and watch a series. This is one they'll watch. I would love yeah. to see it. So whatever it, we can it, do to help that along, we're going to do. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think if that's the only thing that it leaves you wanting more of, even though you do a fantastic job of even just describing what, you know, what Los Velas is like, this little gem in LA. Mm -hmm. um, yeah the visuals are just so stunning and so much is available, but I would binge the hell yeah, out of a documentary. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, congratulations on your success. I know it was doing fantastic on the charts. Yeah, it um, has been. Thank you so much. That's amazing. <laughs> um, and thank you for your time and all of your hard work. Yeah. Thanks for having us. We're so honored. We're like, I was like, somebody reached out to me and wants to talk about this, our series. I was so touched. So we appreciate of course. it. So much. Of well, course. Do you, so, but what's next for you? I mean, yeah. I hope this is not your swan song as far as like podcast, <laughs> because this is a good team. I mean, I know this was a yeah. lot of like many years of work, but yeah, I, I can't wait for your next project. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I have to really think about it. <laughs> we need a, the next story to hit us, you know. Um, <laughs> it will though. We we do like it projects will. together. Yeah, we do really well at that. Yeah, yeah. we have new um, things like children, and she's moving away. So we'll have to find a way to kind of bridge that gap. Yeah. and create the next thing. You got to find the next I piece of property, you. the next house. Yeah, I right. want. Well, look, you've already gone into the tunnels underneath LA, so I want you to do an explosive investigation on the lizard people that supposedly <laughs> live under Los Angeles. <laughs> yes, okay, on it. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? Like, it's one no. of the crazy conspiracy theories that, and it's been around since like the '60s that there are lizard people in caverns under LA. Right. Oh my God. Okay, I will be looking wow, that up. There's a there's a lot of underground LA for sure. That's oh, there's yeah. a lot. Yeah, I can oh, see yeah. it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, where can people find you? So we're available anywhere you get your podcasts, um, Apple, Spotify. Um, and then our website, um, the Los Feliz Murder is um, you're going to want to listen to the podcast. And as you're listening, go to each each episode has a page. Um, so episode one, you you know, the visuals are there um, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's where you can find us. And, and our Instagram. Oh, and our, we're on Instagram. Uh, what are we on Instagram? LFMM podcast. I think that's what we are on Instagram. Yes, I believe so. And on Instagram, actually, I've been posting other extra bonus stuff. So stuff that's not on the website. Um, I've been just posting because it's fun. I'm like, oh, I'll post that. I'll post that. Yeah, there's a ton of stuff. Every time I see a new story, I'm like, oh, something else. Yeah, I try to make it really good. <laughs> so it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you guys again. Um, everybody you. go listen. I will put all of uh, your info where people can find you um, once we... We're going to put our audio up just for our patrons soon. 
Um, and then eventually we'll get this up on YouTube and everybody will be able to find you there. So thank you so much, Stacy and Chloe. Thank you. Thank you so All much. All right. Well. You're welcome. Good night. Thank Bye. you. Thank you everyone for joining us um, behind the couch and we'll catch you in a couple of weeks.